would open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We finished up chapter 7 last week. And as we go into chapter 8, if you're doing some study on your own at home, we don't can't really go into it here, but you'll find sometimes if you're looking at commentators, your Bible may have a footnote. I don't know. Mine doesn't. But uh, chapter 8 and verse 1 it's uh, something that's discussed with uh, among scholars and academics of whether 8-1 belongs with chapter 7 or it actually belongs with chapter 8 where the division is that we've put in there and the numbers and the verses. Um, I tend to think that it goes with the section that we're going to be talking about because of the way the chapter ends. And I think that he ties it all together at the end of the chapter. Either way... We read, Who is like the wise man, and who knows the interpretation of a matter? A man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. This is, uh, uh, as we dive in here, we find that Solomon points out the idea of a, a wisdom uh, when he's talking about interpreting a matter. And we go back through scriptures and we see how God used men to interpret things for other people. You remember how Daniel interpreted uh, things for Nebuchadnezzar. Joseph interpreted dreams for uh, Pharaoh. Um, here he says, who knows the interpretation of a matter? And he's talking about a wise man. He says, uh, man's wisdom illumines him and causes his stern face to beam. Why would his face be stern? His face is be stern because he's thinking. He's trying to, uh, he doesn't know the answer, and he wants to know the answer. And so when he knows the answer, then the wise man's, his, uh, we would say it this way, the light came on, right? It illumines him and his face beams. That's one of the greatest pleasures, I think, of, of being a teacher, right? Or, or sometimes preaching. Uh, you can watch, and it's nice to see the expression on the face of, I don't quite understand it, but as a teacher, you see when those, when your pupils, whoever they are, whether they're small or, or aged, when the light comes on, that's the most satisfying feeling. And so this is why uh, his face beams, because the lights come on and he understands the interpretation or the answer to the question that may be. And Solomon moves into this area uh, uh, now talking about, in verses 2 and following, about uh, serving under governments and kings. And he offers some things, good advice that is certainly parallel for us today. And he says this, I say, keep the, the command of the king because of the oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave him. Do not join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since the word of the king is authoritative, who will say to him, what are you doing? And so as, we, as he talks further about wisdom... He encourages the one, or he says, to make sure you keep your oath. Now, what is this oath kept before the king? The oath uh, is one that would be to the king, to the, the ruling authority, to be under his rule and submit to him. And he says, notice who the oath is made before. The oath is made before God, isn't it? And so he makes it clear, you need to keep the oath to be faithful to him. Now, why would, why would he be saying this? Notice he says, don't be in a hurry to leave him. Don't join in an evil matter, for he will do whatever he pleases. Well, why would he not want to keep the oath? Probably the same reason you and I don't want to sometimes. We're looking at a king here that, that would be wicked or that would come down with a decision that... The individual does not want to keep. And so he doesn't want to keep it. And so he wants to abandon the king. And he wants to leave in a hurry. Notice what he says. Uh, don't leave in a hurry. And do not join in an evil matter. What would that evil matter be? The overthrow of the king. We don't like the way he's acting. We don't care for his decisions. And so I'm going to go and join, if you will, a, a coup attempt. Or I'm going to try to undo what he's doing. Because I don't care for him. He says, this is why you don't want to do it. The word of the king is authoritative, verse 4. Who's going to say to him, what are you doing? And so as this king comes down with this decision, as unpopular as it may be, who's going to be brave enough to get in front of him? What are you doing? 
not going to do that. His word's authoritative. He can take your life. He can put you in jail. He can ruin you forever. You're not going to stand in front of him and undo what he's going to do. Oh, no. He has authority. Notice what he says as well. He goes on. He who keeps a royal command. Remember, we're talking about trying to be wise, aren't we? He who keeps a royal command experiences no trouble. Well, that's pretty easy to understand, isn't it? The king gave a command, and you may not like it, you may not care for it, but the wise person says, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do it because I want to preserve my life and I want to keep the peace. He says, a wise heart knows the proper time and procedure, for there's a proper time and procedure for every delight. If your Bible says delight, I, I, that's not a great translation of the word. Uh, and it can be a little bit confusing. You can write down, some versions will say matter. Others will say activity, okay? For every activity. Uh, though a man's trouble is, is heavy upon him. So what's he saying? You have this king, and he's thrown up this rule, or he's thrown up this law, or he's acting in a way you just don't like. Don't abandon him. Don't join this false attempt. Uh, a wise man's going to wait. He's going to fulfill the command. And he's going to bide his time. Uh, this is something that you and I want to do uh, as well in life. And I've prayed for it many times. He's going to wait for the right time. He's going to wait for the right words and opportunity, right? In order to be able to present whatever he needs to present to this king. Um, you ever pray that in a situation? I, I do. Pray for wisdom. It's like, please let me know when to, when to talk and when to be quiet right? That's even a harder one for us. And uh, let me make sure I use the right words to, 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 to keep the peace and to make sure I use the right words to, to uh, uh, make the best outcome happen. I, I've prayed that before, and, and I'm sure you have too. Uh, and all of us at some time or another have gone the other route, haven't we? Where maybe we didn't stick with that, and we saw the disaster and the trouble that, that came from that very thing. And so Solomon says, if you want to be wise, do what the king says and, and just wait and be patient and understand this. This is what he also says, um, even though it's heavy on him, the point is, is that while you're waiting to, for the right time and the opportunity, uh, it's going to be hard on you. You've had sleepless nights over trouble before, haven't you? Where you just stayed awake and you couldn't sleep because... A situation's coming that you know is going to be tense. A situation's coming where you know it's going to be hard. That's, that's what he's saying this wise man is doing. You're fulfilling the command, and you're waiting for the right time. But while you're waiting, it's going to be heavy on you. It's going to be hard on you. And, uh, but keep on waiting and understand this. If no one knows what will happen, verse 7, who can tell him when it will happen? In other words, nobody has the authority or the power to tell the future. And while you're waiting, uh, if they don't know how to tell the future, they certainly can't tell you when something bad is going to happen. Have you ever been that way where you, you're building up in your mind and you're waiting for the opportunity, you're waiting for the words, and you don't know when things are going to happen, then all of a sudden they sort of take care of themselves? It wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be, and and... And events happen where, where the problem just took care of itself. Wise man, if you want to be wise, hold your horses, right? Wait a little bit. Do what the king's saying. Preserve yourself. Keep the peace. Wait for the right time and opportunity. If it comes, great. If it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't. But you can't tell the future, and it may take care of itself, right? And so when we think about this aspect of it um, it's easy to bring it forward to us today because while we don't have uh, evil people in government today I just wanted to see if you were awake look we've got folks in government just like this don't we I don't like them I don't appreciate them. I don't stand for what they stand for at all. Their policies, I'm way against. And I'm not picking a party, 
Because I could say this about both of the ones we've got in this country. But what do I do about it? Hold your horses, Sean. Remember who put the authority in power. Who established government, right? It's God who established government. He wanted there to be rule and law and order in our societies. And so we could go straight from here to Romans chapter 13. If you're unfamiliar with the text, uh, read it. But it's pretty much the classic text, if you will, about Christians living under the law. You know one law I hate? I hate to pay taxes. I don't know anyone that just says, I can't wait for April 15th. That's a stinky law. But guess what? I do it because I'm under the authority of the law. God established it. I I need to obey the law. There are other laws that I don't like or care for, and I'm sure there are ones that you don't care for. And I'm sure that there are some in which we we aren't always faithful in keeping, and we're gonna we have the right to be punished, right, when we violate those laws. But the fact of the matter is this no matter how wicked the ruler is, how bad his policies are, how much we just don't like him or her. We've got laws to keep, and we serve a higher power, and that higher power says, do what the law says. Now, we know there's an exception to that, right? We do. If a government, uh, someone in authority says, I want you to no longer worship your God, or I want you to make sure that you do not claim Christ as Lord, Well, what do we do? Well, we're going to deny that one, aren't we? As Peter and the rest of the apostles stood before the governing authority of their day, Acts chapter 5, and those men said to Peter and the apostles, we strictly commanded you not to preach in his name, and yet you've put uh, put this man's blood upon us, And spread this teaching throughout the whole city. And Peter responds as we should respond. Whether it's right to you or or you do what you want to do. But we need to obey God rather than man. So if we get to a point, and I pray we don't. I I really do get to a point to where government tries to oppress us and make laws to stop us that we will say this is where we draw the line because this is where God drew the line. We're going to do what he says, not what you say. But until that time, they make laws and they don't violate God's word no matter how much they aggravate the mess out of us. We just have to do it. That's the idea behind being submissive. See, submissive is easy when you agree with the law. Submission in relationships is easy when you agree with each other, right? But submission in the Bible is making sure that you bend to the will of the authority. In this case, we're talking about governments. We bend to their will, and we do it against what we really like or care for why because we love god not because we care for what they're doing but we respect love care for and want to serve god that's that's being submissive and so uh, solomon continues and we have to understand this that is backwards as that feels right sometimes Understand this as well. Authorities only have so much authority. A king only has so much authority. Notice, if you will, verse 8. No man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind or authority over the day of death, and there is no discharge in the time of war, and evil will not deliver those who practice it. 
All this I've seen and applied my mind to every deed that has been done under the sun, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. And so what do we see here? In verse 8, again, if you're doing personal study, you're going to find a couple different opinions on, on this verse. And the reason I'm sharing these with you is because these are very difficult passages for translators to put into our language. And so sometimes there's debate over what they mean. And you remember the rule, right, that I shared with you last week. And that is, if your both opinions don't contradict Scripture, then both can be viable. If it contradicts anywhere else, anywhere else it can't be. Here's the two main opinions. One opinion is, is that these four things he lists in verse 8 all have to do with death. Okay? And so he doesn't have authority, uh, authority, uh, authority to restrain the wind with the wind. He doesn't have authority over the day of death. No discharge in the time of war. Some would add the war with death. Okay, and then others would go on and say that evil's not going to deliver those who practice it in death. All right, so uh, it could be that, or it could be the four different things. the 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 main point is this: the king only has limited authority. Okay, he he his authority only goes so far, and as subjects, we need to understand that. Not only that, we look at this king and Solomon recognizes after he talks about the things he doesn't have authority of, he says, I've seen and applied to my mind every deed that's been done under the sun. So I've been watching all these things that happen to everybody on the earth and a, wherein a man has exercised authority over another man to his hurt. Now, we, we discussed justice at the beginning of, of this series on Ecclesiastes. But we understand here and this is a tough one for us to get sometimes. Um, and this is where it really comes into trusting God. And that is this. God established government, right, as an authority to rule and, and uh, keep order in society. And men who are fallible get put into positions in that government to rule. Now, sometimes... Probably most times, power and authority goes to uh, the head. That's the way we would say it. People abuse it, don't they? And we sit back and we say, well, how could God put that man in office? He's so wicked. The, the answer to it for you and me is, number one, God established the government. He doesn't want wicked people to run things. But we find at the end of the chapter don't bother trying to answer that question, <laughs> right? What you got to do is you got to trust God. Follow the law, trust God. Does it all make sense to you? No, and it's never going to, period, dot. We'll talk about it at the conclusion here in just a few minutes. But Solomon says, I've seen it, and I've watched people in power, and they've taken their power, and they've abused it, and they've abused it to the point to where it hurts those under them. Now, we've seen that even in our country, but man, nothing like what the rest of the world is enduring in many places. In some places, authority says, look, uh, 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 Islam is the, is the state or country religion. You even say the name of Christ and your life is over, right? And we could go on and on and on about that type of thing. But men abuse power. And as long as governments exist, which is going to be until the end of time, there will be fallible, sinful people, uh, wicked people that are in those offices in a lot of places. And they're going to abuse that power. They only have so much authority, but they abuse the authority they do have. Well, Things aren't always as they appear with these leaders either, are they? Notice verse 10. I think it's interesting. Solomon continues on. So then, I've seen the wicked buried. Those who used to go in and out from the holy place, and they are soon forgotten in the city where they did thus. This too is futility. And so he continues this idea of, I believe, the, the rulers. And he says, they used to go in and out to the holy place. Now, 
some commentators are going to say synagogue. On Wednesday night, those who are here, I'm going to ask you why that can't be the case here. I believe it's the temple. But what we're looking at is we're looking at a, a leader, a, a government official, a politician going into worship. But he says he was wicked and he was buried, right? Aren't you glad our politicians don't use religion as a platform to gain votes? Nothing's different today, brethren, than it was in Solomon's day. The wicked person, the politician, goes into the, the temple. And he goes and he goes through the motions, right? He offers his sacrifices. He says his prayers. Everybody sees him. And when he dies, what happens? You notice that he's buried. You remember back earlier in chapter 2, we talked about the man who wasn't able to enjoy things. Solomon says he didn't even receive a proper burial. We're talking about someone here who's got great pomp and, and ceremony and respect. He's a politician. Oh, he used to worship. He was so great. And then we buried him. And what happens at the end after you bury him? You notice he says, they are soon forgotten in the city where they did that. This too is futility. In other words, it's futile. It's really a waste of time for this person to pretend his whole life that he's someone he's not. And he calls him what he is, wicked and buried. And we as citizens, many times, how many times has it been in your lifetime? I'm going to upset somebody. You walk a man who had the great public face to the grave, and the country mourns. John F. Kennedy, right? Pretty on the surface, but man, you don't have to go more than a layer or two behind it to see just horrendous wickedness. And couldn't we say that about many of our leaders? And we could say it about leaders in other countries and then what do we do as a country and a nation? We pour around them and we say how great they were and we lift up their legacy. Solomon says the wicked were buried and when you do all this stuff, it's a waste of time to sit there and praise them and know this, that they're soon forgotten. So he wasn't what he seems. And then because this man got away with it, right, a Looked like he got away with it and was praised by everybody else. Saul moves on to say in verse 11, Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Although a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life, still I know it will be well for those who fear God and fear Him openly, but it will not be well for the evil man, and he will not lengthen his days like a shadow, because he does not fear God. So here's the thing. When there are no apparent consequences for evil, what are people going to do? Evil. They're going to keep doing it. When sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Let me ask you. Are, well, I know the answer to this. Aren't you glad that God doesn't, God doesn't punish the way He used to? Right? I think about um Uzzah you remember Uzzah as David was moving the ark and no one was supposed to touch it it rocked a little bit and Uzzah probably just out of reaction reached up to steady it and guess what bam he's dead not a good day for him instant instant death Nadab and Abihu oh we're going to take something different to worship Fire consumed him on the spot. You remember the, the man who picked up sticks on the Sabbath day in the book of Numbers? Death, right? Instant death. Let me ask you, do you think that, that when Aaron watched his sons and his two other brothers were there watching Nadab and Abihu, when they burned up right in front of them, do you think that that was a deterrent? You know, if you go to Singapore... Uh, Singapore has some pretty stringent laws there. And if you get caught with drugs in Singapore, uh, it's a death sentence. 
Not a lot of drugs in Singapore, right? But here's the, the point is, when sentence isn't executed quickly, then we think we got away with it. That's why part of the reason why we think, oh, I can go on and, and live and sin and do what I want to do, no, no consequences, right? Not going to pay for it, you know? But understand, it's not going to work out well for you. If that's the life you're going to live, Solomon makes it clear. He says, even though a sinner does evil a hundred times and may lengthen his life. Now, this can be confusing because in verse 12, he says he can lengthen his life. In verse 13, he says he can't lengthen his life. What's he saying? He's saying this. Why, it may appear to you and me that this man's got away with wickedness over and over and over, and he got, he got to live to a ripe old age, right? Understand, he's not going to get away with it. I know that it will be well for those who fear God and who fear Him openly. It won't be well for the evil man. He won't lengthen his days. On the other side of the coin, there are people who live an evil life, and because of their evil life, they, they die before their time, if you will. They don't live to be a ripe old age. They're not going to get away with it either. Their life is cut short, and afterwards isn't any good for them. So who's it going to be good for? We see the central message of the book. It will be well for those who fear God, who fear Him openly. Now, I think this is a very important point for you and me. When we read that we need to fear God and fear Him openly, may I ask if Christianity for you, if Christ your Redeemer for you, is something that you keep private? We're sort of that way in society, aren't we? That's the way we are now. We, we've, we've got our nice homes, and, and especially with our pandemic mentality, we've, we've made nice offices at home. We've got our nice comfy sofas. We've got our big old jammy TVs, and we stream everything in the world, and we can shop there, and we make sure Amazon brings us what we want and our groceries, and I don't have to leave. Who knows you're a Christian? Who knows that you follow God? When we go out in public, when we're around other people, and I would say that us being here this morning is a, is a great example of how we are fearing God openly. Anyone can come here. We don't have a closed service. All doors are open. Please come and hear the gospel. Please come and meet God's children. As when we're trying to make application and pull it to ourselves aside from doing this, when we leave here, people know we follow God. You know, Jesus did it, didn't he? I think about Jesus in the temple. There are a couple of passages in the New Testament where he's in the temple and uh, or they're coming out to get him before his crucifixion. He says, why are you coming out to me as robbers? I was daily in the temple. I spoke openly to you. I didn't do anything in secret, John 19 says. He, he, was a, he was a public mouthpiece for God. Isn't that what you and I should be? If we want it to be well for us, we're going to fear God openly, right? We're not going to, we're not going to cower behind uh, being a monk or being on our own or, or silence. We, we've got to let people know, I serve God Almighty. Right? He wants you to be part of his family. Well, he continues on and we find this. If things are appear this messed up as far as leaders go and evil getting away from things, we know we need to fear God. He says, but there's also a futility that's done here. And this really ties in well with verse 10, I think. And we've talked about this in chapter 7, and I'm not going to go back over it, but he says there's a futility, you know, a waste of a wasted activity which is done on the earth. Righteous men, there are righteous men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the wicked. On the other hand, there are evil men to whom it happens according to the deeds of the righteous. I say that this too is futility. We've, and again, we talked about it. good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. Always going to be this way. And so what are we supposed to do about it? Here's what Solomon says. Verse 16. says, I, So I commended pleasure, for there's nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and drink. 
and to be merry, and this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which what? What does it say? Which God has given, right? To him under the sun. And so, here's what you do. When you're looking at the world being upside down, and all backwards, and evil ruling, and righteous people being treated horribly, trust God, fear Him openly, eat, drink, and be happy. Not the idea of, um, of, of wickedness, but be joyful and appreciate the blessings of today. Okay? And He goes on to give us this reminder, and He says here, if I can get these extra eyeballs open. He says, when I gave my heart to know wisdom, and this is why I tie one in with it, to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, I saw every work of God. I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though a man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. So here's the thing. Eat, drink, and be merry. Be happy about it. And understand this, you can stay awake 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, trying to look for the purpose of life. You can work hard at it, laboriously, he says. You can even get so haughty that you're a wise person and you can say, I understand it. No, you cannot understand it. And here's why. Because God says he's made it so you can't discover it. Don't try to pick apart the complexities of life. Let me tell you what. If God wants to keep a secret from you, He knows how to do it. So instead, let's be happy today. Let's fear God openly. Thank Him for the blessings of life. And enjoy, enjoy what He's given us. And let's leave the complexities of life and the troubles of life and all the things that are upside down in life. Leave it to God. You'll sleep so much better when you do. Now, as we wrap this thing up, I want you to go back and take a look, if you will, at verse 8. In verse 8, as he's talking about this authority, sort of struck me yesterday, and I think it's profound, not because of me, but because of the Lord. He says, no man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind. You know, Solomon uses this language elsewhere, right, as far as striving after the wind. He says, no man has authority to restrain the wind with the wind. And I couldn't help but think about Matthew chapter 8. When the disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee, and the storm arises, and he is asleep in the boat, and they come and say, Master, we're going to perish. And he says, oh, you of little faith right and he stands up and he commands the seas and the winds and they respond who is this man that he can command the wind and the seas and they obey him yeah no man has authority over the wind but my savior does No man has authority over the day of death. And I think about Revelation chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, where the Lord says, Behold, I was dead, but I am now living evermore. I have the keys to death and to Hades. Look, if you want your life to end well, and you want your life to be good right now, it's only going to be that way in one place, in one location, and that's in Jesus Christ. I hope that you'll consider these things. The world's going to keep being a mess, folks. I'd lie to you. I'd be lying to you if I said it any different. The world's going to keep being a mess. You're going to keep being perplexed at it. Let's just give all that to the Lord and say, I trust you. I believe in you. I'll put you on in baptism. And I'm going to do my best to walk for you and tell other people about you. Leave all the heavy lifting to you. Levi's going to lead us in a song of encouragement. If you need to respond this morning, you meet me or one of the elders out back afterwards. We'll be glad to give you a hand, do whatever we can to help you get to heaven. That's what we want to do. If you will, Levi, why don't you stand while we stand and sing?